Napa, but you guys can move wherever you want to. If you want to enjoy some coffee, please go right ahead. This is your time. <laughs> hey, we're going to start to, uh, our service together with singing just like we always do. So, hey, let me invite you to join with us. Here we go. Good to have you here. I got to go through my whole spill, okay? So this is just practice for like the next time. So uh, it's great to have you here today. And if you are a guest with us today, <laughs> and we, we might have some guests. I I, I would say I, I see some unfamiliar faces, but I always see unfamiliar faces. So it is good to have everybody here. If you are a guest, we would love to have you fill out one of our guest cards in the, the chair backs uh, in front of you and, and just share some information. We just really want to know that you were here, get to know you a little bit, and celebrate your presence. But it's good to be in the house of the Lord worshiping together 
uh, whether it's here, whether it's there, whether it's uh, out of town, wherever God's people are together, uh, there is the house of the Lord. It's not a building, it is a people. And so it is great to be with you this morning. So, hey, uh, this month uh, we are uh, starting uh, our, our recognition and our emphasis on North American missions. East Haven has always uh, supported and, and been a great part. Missions has always been part of the heart of, of East Haven, whether that's international missions or supporting North American missions uh, all over our country, all over our world. And, and right now with the Annie Armstrong offering for North American missions, uh, we are looking at that and we're going to be praying about that this month and, and seeing how we can support that uh, financially and through our prayers and, and, and through giving and through going. And so, hey, let's watch a little video and we'll, uh, we'll start this time of emphasis together. Questions. People ask, what kind of missionary are you? Or they want to know exactly what it is a missionary does. Or a lot of times you'll hear people say, a missionary here? You mean that's a thing? Well, there's 281 million lost people in the U.S. and Canada. So, yeah, it's a thing. But there's one question no one ever asked me, and I wish they would. No one ever asked you where is the finish line? That's the question I want to hear. What does Mission Accomplish look like? You can watch videos about North American missionaries like me. You can read stories about us. You can pray for us. But don't get so caught up in the methods and minutia of what we do that you miss the main thing. Everything you see and hear and read about us is really just a means to an end. We start churches to make Jesus known. We meet needs to make Jesus known. We move to unfamiliar places, we meet unreached people, and we attempt unrealistic things just to make Jesus known. There is nothing more important than that. Nada. Nothing at all. Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And so that's what our finish line looks like. It looks like obedience, same as your finish line. God speak. You give, we go. Everything starts with your gift to the Annie Armstrong is the offering. Those gifts enable us to go places where the gospel has never been. This is where we cross our finish line. This is where together we make Jesus known.
is not an obstacle but an opportunity for us i mean look at the way we're set up and robert's doing a great job it's just intimate you know a little more informal i'm glad you're here i mean i've i've I've, john and his family were here last week see if we were in there and it was i wouldn't be able to say that to john i I might not even see him back there because i don't usually wear my glasses when i want to see i wear my glasses but I met a family over here that usually sits in the back, but they're having to come up front. Besides that, this is a good day to run the aisles. So just look out. Maybe do a little practice. A little practice. Like Brother Robert said, Pastor Robert said, Robert said, this is kind of a a way to kind of go through things. But uh, I I am so glad that you're here for this opportunity that we have to uniquely worship the Lord. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, there's a new member of class going on and running right there. So I'm going to surprise them right after I pray. I'm going to slip in there and say, hey, what y'all doing? I mean, it's, it's good. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Laughter's like good medicine. Take God seriously, not ourselves too seriously. I'm glad you're here. Let's pray. Dear God, we are, we are thankful to be in this place of worship. 
Thank you for the songs that we've been singing about your faithfulness. You never fail us. You're still alive. You're still alive and we rejoice. The Sunday after Easter is just as great as last Sunday because it's all about the fact that you are a risen Savior and you never fail us. So I pray, Lord, if there's somebody here might be worried about something, you know their heart, you know their worry, you know their concern. And I pray, God, they'll cast their care on you. That you'll give them peace. You'll speak to them as we continue this time of worship, a time of studying your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for this next song. How about that? Thy worship you, Almighty.
Well, I hope that you have a copy of the notes section. Even if you don't take notes, you can kind of see where we're going. And did you see the title? I mean, when I looked over the next section in our study of Ephesians, that's what came to my mind. Cussing, immorality, greed, and some other stuff. And so that's what we're going to consider as we walk through continue to walk through the book of Ephesians. Now, we took a break. In case you're a guest, you've only been with us for a few weeks. We took a break from our study of Ephesians during the Easter season. Intentionally, we've uh, been walking through the book of Ephesians for a while now. We had part one, and now we're in part two, and we may take a break in the summer and go into part three in the fall. We'll just see how things play out. Now, is there anybody in here? See, I probably won't do this in the second service. Is there anybody in here that knows about something that might be going on tomorrow that's unique for our world? Anybody? Oh, I'm thinking you do. The eclipse. Okay. Well, it's all over the news in case you don't get a hard cover of the newspaper. I mean, there's a whole section from the USA Today Sunday edition of the Claire and Landry. I mean, there's all kind of details in case you want to you wanna look at it. But don't, don't get it until after the second service because I want to show them too. And then there's, a, there's an article in the Daily Leader, our local paper. And here's, here's a part of it because you may be thinking, well, how is this going to affect us in Mississippi, specifically in Brookhaven? What to expect from the eclipse? Let me just read a few sentences here. According to Eclipse2024.org, did y'all know there's a, there's a website? You can look at details in case you want, you're taking notes. It, it's called Eclipse2024, the number, the miracle of 2024.org. Mississippians will be able to see anywhere from 80% to 98% of the sun covered when the moon moves between the earth and sun Tuesday afternoon. Wait, so it's Tuesday? It's tomorrow? That's our daily leader. That's our daily leader. Okay, well, anyway, there's a mistake. I think I might, see, I can change that before the next service, right? That's right. But I won't be quoting, I'll say, and I don't want to point out an error on their part. I can just say, let's see, what can I, I'll figure it out. Uh, I can say, it, it has happened Tuesday. Well, this, I don't know. I got to think on. That's right. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, anyway, y'all heard it first right here, unless you've already read it. It says Tuesday right here. Anyway. All right. In Brookhaven, residents can expect to see about 89% of the sun covered. The partial eclipse is expected to begin at approximately 1231 According to this, p.m. With the time of maximum coverage, 1.51 p.m., experts with the University of Mississippi Medical Center caution that special eclipse safety glasses or viewers must be used at all times during the partial phases. Now, there's people that fall all over the spectrum about all this, and that's fine. Here's what I would tell you, my, just personally, when I read that, if I read that right, not Tuesday, but on Monday, there's going to be darkness during lunch hour. So personally, my greatest concern is, am I going to be able to see what I'm eating at that time? That's my deal. But it, no concerns, because I know what you're saying. You can say, you remember, you got a flashlight on your phone. Remember, Pastor Robert, Brother Robert did that last week. Robert did that, so I did too. So that's what I'm going to do. Besides that, I, I think I'm good. But... Y'all are thinking, well, where are we, what, what is going on with this? So here's what we're going, here's what's going on. In the eclipse, the sunlight doesn't shine as bright for a while. What we're going to learn in Ephesians, where we're landing in the text, is that as believers, we're to shine the light of Christ and if we drift back in to allowing the flesh to control our life, then we provide darkness 
instead of the light of Christ for a watching world. Besides that, it can make us miserable. So, if you hadn't already done so, let's look at it. It's in Ephesians. And it's right here in chapter 5. We left off with verse 2. We went through verses 1 and 2 the last time we were together. This particular section is about Christian living. And that's what the writer, the Apostle Paul, writing the church at Ephesus is saying, Look, you once were in the dark. Now you've seen the light of Christ. And so follow the light. And therefore, as you abide in him, light will naturally come out of you to shine the light on Christ. So he says in verse 3, but among you, there must not be even any hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such as a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words. But because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. In other words, God's wrath come on those that are disobedient because he disciplines those he loves. Verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it is said. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Dear God, help us to see the truth of your word right now and how to apply it so we might be a light in a dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your listening sheet, let's look at some things that we can pull out of the text. First one is this. Some sins from our past should stay there. In other words, in our past. Let's walk through two or three. These are subpoints, not blanks in your outline, but you can write them down if you make notes or just make some mental notes. One is sexual immorality. It's listed first, not because it's the worst, but because in that day it was the most prevalent, which is significant because if you look at our world today, the same could be applied in many cases. It was prevalent because Ephesus was the center of the worship of the fertility goddess Artemis, who was known as Diana. The Greek word for immorality is where we get the word pornography. This includes all kinds of sexual sins outside of marriage. God created sex for good for marriage. He has boundaries, and when he provides boundaries, it's for our good. Hence why this text should help us today. All kinds of sexual sins would be, outside of marriage, would be adultery, fornication, homosexuality, prostitution, just as examples. Sexual sin only disgrades our humanity and leaves us empty. Sure, might be fine fun, they say, for a season, but it leaves one empty. And as a child of God, one especially knows that, whether it's that type of sin or any other. But certainly that, because the Bible speaks of this as one that definitely has results in a negative way for our lives. Another one is greed. Greed is lust for more. Oftentimes, we think of money and finances, and we should, but it could be for the lust. It could be for a job. It could be for any number of things. 
Jesus told us in Luke chapter 16, verse 13, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth. You cannot serve both God and your grandchild. You cannot serve both God and being a hunter. You cannot serve both God and loving your style of music or instrument. You cannot serve both God, fill in the blank. In other words, God wants us to enjoy life. He has things for us to enjoy. But we're to seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So he should be first. And God helps us understand that when Jesus speaks about that. Here's another one. Shameful talk. Speaking in a way that's degrading to someone, disgraceful, some would call it gutter talk. It can silence opportunities to make Christ known, and it hardens our witness and walk. And when we speak that way, usually the, the Holy Spirit convicts us. The longer we walk with him, the more it's like, mm -mm -mm, you shouldn't have said that. Ah, that's a word from the past. Not to, you, need, you need to work on that. And he, it's what the Holy Spirit does. He lets us know. We've probably all been there at some point in our life. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful in building others up, that it may benefit those who listen. So we have to keep that in mind, that God wants us to be careful what we say. And what we said in the past isn't always what we should say in the future. What this passage is saying in this first section of the text today is that believers have been born again. We do not have a pattern of these behaviors or a flippancy toward these sins anymore. They should stay in the past. I cannot, when I was preparing this past week, I was reminded of my granddaddy Overstreet, my mom's dad. And he was raised in East Abuchi, Mississippi. I may have told you that before. Does anybody know where East Abuchi is? It's, it's somewhere close to Laurel and Hattiesburg. I've only been there one time. I went on a venture several years back. I was in, I was in Mississippi. We were living in Florida, and I thought, I've always heard about East Abuchi. I'm going to go find it. So I went and found East Abuchi. And one of the reasons it always interested me was not just because my granddaddy was there and all that he used to say, but he used to say that when he was baptized, he went to the East of Butchie Baptist Church, he became a Christian. They didn't baptize in a nice baptismal. They're out in a pond. And so they were out in a pond, and he was baptized, and his buddy, who had some kind of reputation from the past, was baptized. Well, it was cold that day. And so when his buddy came up, he used some vulgarity in describing how cold the water was. And my granny would just laugh about that. I heard that story. If I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times. He's always loved to hear it. And he liked to do it in front of my daddy because he knew my preacher daddy had made him a little nervous, especially when he'd tell it in front of me as a child. So that's what I thought about. Now, now here's what I'd say. Do, do I think that man was lost? No, I, I don't believe that. He was a brand new Christian. He was just born again. And so he was doing something from his past that was just a part of his life. And he'd not grown or matured enough yet to be more careful. And yet I think anybody might be tempted if you're baptized in ice water to maybe say something we shouldn't say. So that's not, that's not what we're, we're, we're saying here. What we're saying here is that I don't think that automatically meant he wasn't born again. I think it meant he was immature in his faith. And he didn't realize from the norm that wasn't him anymore, and he needed to grow in his faith. Here's what Chuck Swindoll says about this. The key is whether we deliberately persist in a lifestyle that resists the Lord or whether the general tenor of our lives reflects a godly direction. Oh, I like that. I think that summarizes it. Now, before we move on to point number two from the text, here's what Billy Graham says. The more we do it, meaning involved in sins of the flesh, the easier it is to practice lust, 
greed, hate, lying, stealing, whatever it might be. Pride, jealousy, anger, these things beset all of us. And the more we yield to the pressure, the more easily we will yield the next time. So it's a reminder for us as Christians that in the world in which we live in, we need to be very careful. We keep our eyes on Jesus, that we know that this is total truth, not what's in the newspaper. We learned that, didn't we? Or uh, on social media or whatever, that that we might be exposed to what people say. We need to stay close to Jesus. We need to know. We need to know his word so we don't allow the things of the world to gradually slip into our lifestyle or our churches or our homes that may not be of God, that at some point we would have never allowed. But at this point... We do. Now, here's what I'd say. Y'all, there's a difference between preference and convictions. Okay? So, we have to be careful as that is Baptist. For example, this is a great way to do this. Look how I'm dressed. Oh, me. I am dressed. My mama would not be happy (laughs) right now. And my dad, I can see him now. He'd just look at him. He had a look. He had a look. So, back in the day. Where I grew up, you know, uh uh-uh. You do not do this. You do not dress like this. I don't care if you're not in there. You don't do it. How? What are you thinking? Well, now that's a preference. Now, I get it. For some, you say, well, you're in the Lord's house. Whatever. Here's what I tell you. We need to take a strong stand on our convictions, not our preferences. Let's don't get them confused. Let's make sure we don't get them confused. That's where we plant. We don't die. We don't uh, pick a hill to die on over a preference from something we think is right. Maybe just because a godly mom or dad had a certain way about them. We need to know what the truth says. Now, there's a second thing we see from our text. It's this. Some suggestion for our future that will shine everywhere. Now, if there's some struggle from the sins that were listed, know that God is gracious and he forgives. And if you're not a believer, you need to know that if the Lord is convicting you of sin, put your faith and trust in him. Don't think, I got to clean up before I come in. No, admit your sin and put your faith in him. And he is the one that cleans us up over time and helps to see what is wrong and what is right. He may be using this passage today to make a course correction through repentance and seeking help. Christian counseling is distancing yourself from someone that provides an unhealthy relationship. Remember, the Bible says bad company corrupts good character. So if the Lord is speaking to you in that regard, let him. When a person is born again, it brings new life It brings new light into their lives. I heard a story, read a story, and you perhaps have heard this one before, about a guy who was lost as could be. Maybe it was like my granddaddy's buddy. I mean, he didn't speak right. His actions were crude. He was mean to other people. He was a drunkard. He didn't just drink. He drank to get drunk. The Bible's clear about being drunk, and it is wrong. And so he was just a wretched man. He used to hang out with a rough crowd, and he was usually the leader of that crowd. It affected his marriage. It it certainly affected his finances. I mean, it was rough. But then he was born again, and he came into the light. And the Lord gradually started changing his heart and his friends. And he began to not spend as much time with those that he'd spent time with. Still loved them, but not all of them were fond of this new person. They felt like they didn't know anymore. And so one day, one of those in particular gave him a hard time about the fact that he didn't drink anymore to get drunk. And so he used that passage that so often is used. His old buddy tried to trick him. And he talked about Jesus. He said, didn't Jesus turn water into wine? And the fact that he'd only been a a believer for a short short time, this was his answer because he'd never heard that. This is what he said. His buddy was named as Fred. He said, Fred, I don't know anything about that passage. I don't know about that. I can't say if Christ turned water into wine at that house, but I know that he's changed beer into furniture in my house. (laughs) He'd gone from darkness to light 
and it had changed his life, and God was still working on him. The latter part of our passage talks about the value of light. Jesus himself says, I am the light of the world. And as we abide in him automatically, we should share more light and reflect more light, the light of Christ. I mentioned this, alluded to this at the Haven Cross. First of all, last week, we held a flashlight in the dark to see words. Why? Because the light dispels when they're, and I, I followed Robert's lead. So, and he shined it on wheels. It was still dark out there. And so why did he pull that out? Because it dispels darkness. He was able to see. And so I did the same. And that's the thing about light we need to remember is that if, if, we, if we live the light of Christ, it can dispel darkness by God's grace. Here's the second thing. Lights attract attention. Once those bright lights go up out there at that cross, there'll be a lot more attention. From what I understand, they're going to be bright. And if I hear everything right and understand everything right, people will clearly at night be able to see, man, is there a ball game going over there? What is going on? Have y'all ever done that? I've, I've been in different places. You see these bright lights. Usually you think, man, there must be a ball game going on. I wonder who's playing. Well, there ain't no ball game. But it's the cross that reflects the, the cross of Christ. And we don't know on this side of heaven, we'll never know how God might use it. And so that's the other thing. Bright lights give more attention to the Christ that we love and we serve. We're to walk as children of light. Let's be clear what it means to expose in verse 11. That doesn't mean we parade other sinners in front of some moral code and dealing with lost people. This is talking of two believers here, the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. Lost people act lost. No, light doesn't attack. It simply reveals what's there by way of contrast. An example is when one honest person who believes in Christ has high integrity and does not and others do not whatsoever, then dishonesty, if they're honest person, is exposed. Max Lucado said, live in such a way that the world will be glad we did. In other words... This particular text is not about church discipline. This is about church representing Jesus in the workplace, at school, with our family, wherever we might be. That's what it's talking about. And when we do, it draws people's attention, not people's attention. The attention of people to Christ, not us. That's not what he's saying there. It needs to be to Christ. And that last verse, verse 14, most scholars believe that was an older hymn, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, back to the eclipse. I have some glasses here. Now, to me, they're pretty cool looking. I got them in Florida when I lived there at the Walgreens. We're talking high dollar glasses here. Not really. Now, if I were to say, because most of you are probably aware, there are certain types of glasses you're supposed to wear tomorrow. Not Tuesday. Tomorrow. 1251, I think. That's what it said. Is that right? 1231. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to mess my lunch up. You would say, I, well, those might be cool, but that, that's not going to work for me because it'll damage, it could damage your eyesight and affect you the rest of your life. You, you want to get expert advice, so you won't be in the dark, live in the dark, ruin your sight for the rest of your life. Here's what we've learned today. God has shown us in his word. He's the expert. I'm not. You're not. Favorite radio show, whatever. They're not. I'm sure they're good. But God has all truth. And he's shown us today how to live in the light. We need to listen to the expert. 
so we won't mess up our witness and go back into the dark. That's our past. We're going forward into the light. Dear God, we thank you for today. Thank you for showing us through your word what is truth, how to move forward in our life. God, so often as believers, we struggle with certain things, proclivity to certain sins or strongholds. And God, there is certainly a place for counseling, for scripture memory, all those uh, fellowshipping and sharing with one another to pray for one another. All those things are so important. But God, help us never to forget that one of the most important things we can do is abide in you, worship you, spend time with you, pray, cry, laugh with you, read your word, just grow in our personal devotional life on a regular basis, God, so we won't worry, we won't drift back into the, the, the ways of the past, and we might love the light and shine the light in a world that certainly needs to see you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just stand. We're going to have an invitation. Guess who's going to be here at the front? I am. And if you need me to pray for you or you'd like to ask a question about our particular church or fellowship or whatever, I certainly will do my best to, to answer any questions. And uh, Robert's going to lead us in our song. Okay? Holy Spirit, Thank you again. Y'all can be seated just for a minute. I want to give you a few reminders before you leave. <clears throat> One is, well, I almost forgot. I need to pray before we take up the offering. Let's pray. God, I pray that as we take up the offering, whatever happens, God, that you would just remind us that you have rained down your love for us and on us. And God, we're so grateful. Thank you for giving so that we might have life. We thank you for reminding us of our Annie Armstrong once in offering here that helps tell people about you here in the States. In Jesus' name, amen. Next week, from all indications, we'll be back in our continually renovated worship center. Remember, things have to look ugly before they look good. All right? So just remember that. So we'll be back in there. <clears throat> and we now, this, now, now here's what I tell you. That doesn't mean that maybe we may not have to do something like this again. But it won't be, from everything we can tell, it won't be next week. So next week, regular schedule. We'll let you know if we change something up in weeks ahead before all this is finished. Hungry men. The conference, we've got at least, as I checked on Friday, and some more maybe have signed up online, but we had 65. When we met as a leadership team, we were hoping for 100 our first year, and I think, I think that's probably going to happen. So uh, Robert did a great little video on Facebook yesterday. Some of you are already sharing it. Let's continue to share it. This is not just for our church, just like Hungry Men Breakfast. This is for people in our community and beyond. So I'm hoping that folks will sign up and, uh, and get their ticket. 
Also, uh, last thing I want to say is if you, if you observe tomorrow what's going on with the uh, eclipse, don't wear bad glasses. Get you some pro glasses, all right? I'm just messing with you there. But it is true. Don't ruin your eyes. Let's stand. And Robert's going to lead us in our dismissal. And then you can go out that way and that way. And you might, as my daddy used to say, beat the Methodist to the restaurant today. Because you're way early. All right, Robert. See you next week.